Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this. Uh, I wonder what, what's the year we're holding this LSF MM. I think it's like fifth or so. <coughs> Used to be LSF, then MM, and now LSF MM BPF, abbreviation of letters. But I think every year the conference is getting better. Uh, yesterday was a great day. I think very productive. And thanks a lot to organizers of the conference and the Linux Foundation. I think collectively you guys picked a great location. Uh, my expectations for the Salt Lake City was lower than it is, but <clears throat> the venue is great, hotel is great, the city is awesome. Yesterday a beer event was nice, comparing to plumbers. Uh, so I hope the rest of the week will go well. So let me start with agenda. So I want to talk for the, uh, briefly cover the last, by the way, uh, this year will be 10th year that BPF uh, exists. It started roughly like early 2014, the first patches had landed, and around September uh, 2014, the system call, BPF system call was introduced, so effectively we are celebrating 10 year anniversary. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, we'll cover what we achieved in the last 10 years, and then we'll talk what I think, as an ecosystem, as an infrastructure, we need to think about to effectively stay relevant. Because as anything in the, in the technology world, everything involves, if we stop, like effect, well, we'll die. Uh, how BPF started? Like at the beginning, the use case was realistically like only one. People wanted to do programmable networking, and that's how it was created. It was the engine designed to process packets when the packets are received. And, pretty much nothing more, but it was clear that just by staying with the packet processing engine, it's like we don't uh, discover the full potential of the engine, what we can do with the programmable engine in the kernel. So tracing and observability became the obvious kind of second target. And I'm stealing the Brandon Gregg slide uh, from his performance book here that nicely illustrate how it's all connected. Essentially, just like different kernel events, uh, performance event, trace points uh, that get triggered, triggers by a program. And so creation of that, um, again in 2015, uh, sparked a new generation of tools. Like BPF trace came shortly after, like BCC. And at that time, the VPF actually didn't quite exist. It actually came later, which is, well, interesting tidbit. And since then, I would say the, everything that we know in VPF, it was evolving because there was a reason, because there was like a motivation to do so. Like the first one was the challenge from um, user space networking tool. As the roots of VPF came in networking, user space networking like DPDK, they demonstrated that you can do like much like line rate packet processing in software, whereas kernel was, was simply simply struggling to do so, and that was pretty much because of the the way the network stack is designed, designed for uh, flexibility, for ease of adding like different protocols where different callbacks, the SK, SK socket buffer itself, it's a big data structure like populating it, like sending to a stack when you only need to do, let's say, packet forwarding, like takes time. So that's how XDP was created. And essentially the idea is, well, as simple as you can imagine, just running BPF programs as close to the hardware is receiving it. So running the stuff in the, in the NIC. And again, because this technology like was added to the kernel, immediately like uh, tools started to pop up in the user space. So Catran was the first one to demonstrate it to the world that XDP is, well, <laughs> viable technology and challenged the uh, existence of the DPDK. Uh, Cilium uh, came shortly after. And it's interesting that eventually DPDK uh, transitioned from um, implementing all of the drivers in user space, but actually using XDP as, as part of their backend. So GPDK can now run on top of XDP. Uh, similar uh, situation happened in the um, tracing part. The tools like BCC, and while well, still BPF trace, they require uh, kernel headers to be installed on the server before any kind of observability can happen, because kernels are different. and headers provide the information about layout, where all of the data structures in the kernels are. 
And obviously there are like security complications. People don't want to have compilers on the box. Plus it takes uh, time to start these programs where it needs to like compile and everything. So that's how, that's the, realistically the only reason why BTF and compile once everywhere. Core, as we know, was invented. And the idea is also looks simple. What we do, we annotate the kernel with uh, the back information with effectively layout information, what fields exist in the kernel at what offsets. And then we do this uh, extension to the C language where we're saying instead of using, telling the compiler instead of using fixed offset to the data structure, we're adding symbolic access, which I think is actually like very cool as a concept. And I don't think there is any other like language exists that adopts this kind of like idea where access becoming becoming like symbolic and then once it's all done we have a prep work on the kernel side and compiler did its job and then like libpf is just doing this relocation adjusting the offset from the symbolic to the fixed one depending on what kernel you are running so everything i'm sure like every one of you have already well knew what i'm talking about hope there are no surprises um, then less, I would say, known part is uh, BPF skeleton. Um, it's it's also like it was created uh, out of necessity. Um, programs, especially like still like majority of BPF programs are written in C, and in C, it used to be the the model, the BPF model, like it dictated that you have to use maps to like put any kind of data in there. So there will be programs and maps. So you don't have like anything else. And any map would require this additional like map lookup interface to like access the map and put the data in there. In a normal like language, you just have like global and static variables and you just access them directly. This is how like you write a normal C. So if you have allows to do that, but as soon as you start doing it, there is no way for, there was no easy way for user space to access those like global and static variables that programmers create. So that's one of the motivation for the skeleton to exist. It just like takes the program, uh, compiles it into this like, special header file. In the header file, based on BTF information, it generates the structs, the C structures in the same layout that the program wanted. Not not the program, but the way the compiler decided to uh, place all of the like global variables in this like BSS and data sections. Effectively, it like, matches the layout of the sections, and then like user space can just like read and write with a normal um, C, uh, C style code. Uh, usability improvements didn't stop there. Uh, always online is no longer necessary. Shouldn't be a surprise, but I think like week doesn't pass by when there is a patch from somebody that's still like adding a self test is using like always in line. It's not necessary, and this is actually the reason why programs are now like hitting this one million like instruction limit because like everything is being aligned. The forcing people are still forcing the compiler to inline everything and pass it to the kernel as a single program. So support for this initially for the what we call sub programs or static functions was added. That's already like eight years ago. Then support for global functions was added. Then support for global and this arg underscore annotations was added. So there were like huge number of changes that happened and all of them actually quite in the past except this arg underscore stuff. Don't use always in line. So we need, I suspect, I feel we need to do something better in terms of like evangelizing the better practices because that's still, uh, people still suffer, uh, feel that BPF is hard to use because they're using like 10 year old like techniques like always in line. Uh, similar evolution happened over the last 10 years with loops. Initially loops were just not supported at all. So if you want normal looking for loop, you have to use this pragma, pragma unroll full to effectively force compiler to unroll all alterations of the loop. And in this case, like if you have like more than 100, anything would not be like practical because like your program will, the size of the program will explode and like it will take, it will not be verifiable. In 2019, bounded loops were added. So from usability point of view, from user's point of view, the only thing that affected them is like, now they can remove this uh, pragma unroll because the verifier in this case would do this 
unroll by simulating every iteration of the loop. And because like every iteration is simulated, again, more than anything, more than like 100 would not be practical. 2001, VPF loop helper was added uh, that can now support like 1,000, 100,000 of uh, different iteration, but done through the callback. And just uh, 23 open code iterators that uh, we added that add extra call at the prologue, extra call at epilogue, and extra call for every iteration of the loop. Uh, but now with this like BPL4 macro, the loops become like much nicer to like see and write because this callback approach in, in 2021, like if you have um, a loop with a single body, that's, it's okay to write, but as soon as you have like two nested loop, one inside another, then you have a callback, then a side callback, you have another callback, it immediately becomes like completely unreadable. The algorithm is just like pain. So <clears throat> funny enough, well, maybe not that funny, uh, especially from security folks, that since 21 there was a bug in the BPF loop, and 23 there was still a bug in open code iterators that was fixed only at the end of uh, 2023. So for two years we had the bug in the verifier that allowed, uh, uh, well, potentially like people could like crash the kernel, which is obviously like, not good. Well, we learned our lesson, fixed it. Uh, Let's see what happens next. So uh, the next evolution as the, of loops was introduction of this may go to or conditional breaks. Think of it as uh, country uh, scat um, in the kernel where you're telling the kernel that like, if you want to reschedule me, like reschedule, that's what country scat does in the kernel. In similar concept here, conditional break says break me like break out of the loop if you think like I'm looping too much. So in this case, again, like loops of many iterations are possible, including, including this infinite loop. So you can like write your algorithms, assuming, well, with infinite loop, the true infinite loop, but uh, PPF runtime will break you out of the loop if you're like loopy looping too far. And that's again, like, it, like um, open code interactors been now for two years and still there are patches uh, that that are using BPF loop. So even July, uh, like, I don't think the documentation will be enough. So it's uh, something else I feel that we need to do to tell uh, the developers that there are like much easier tools to use at their disposal. Um, then uh, not only usability of the program of the programs changed over the years. Um, we've changed how how the programs interface with the kernel. At the beginning, they were like helpers only, and the idea was we had like one enum with a set of IDs that are fixed, and every helper provides a stable API between the program and the kernel, um, and there were like obvious like uh, limitations to that. First is like your API. Like if you make a mistake, we have we will have to <laughs> live with that mistake forever. Um, and the second that's uh, because there is only one enum for the whole kernel, the helpers cannot be added by kernel modules. And in general, like because of the UPI, there is a resistance uh, to add anything. So in ten years, we added twenty two hundred helpers, and since then, said. So enough of the helpers introduced this, what we call now a KFUNC mechanism, which is unstable. Kernel modules, modules can add it, and so in general, it's, a, it's not only cleaner mechanism, but like from the, we don't have to rely on compiler optimizations, in particular for the helpers that are doing this, even GCC folks, well, added this kernel helper stuff because we were relying on a hack in a Clang to make the helpers work because it's like called by number. So KFunk is a much cleaner interface and definitely the way to go. Uh, on the opposite side, so this is like VPF calling into kernel. On the opposite side, we also have changed a lot uh, how the kernel calls into BPF program. Initially, similar like in networking use case, there was a set of hooks. Well, it's still there and it will stay there forever, the stable UAPI hooks where the programs can attach, like TC, like XDP, well, WT, like now we have 
so many and like LWT, probably no one will use ever, but this LWT and LWT out is still there. We cannot remove it. Would like to, but we cannot. Like there is this SCAD uh, in ATC, there is like classifier in action. So classifier is used by everyone, whereas action pretty much by no one because it's stable. We cannot remove it either. So this is all the like lessons that we learned. So the new mechanism that we introduce is called Structops. Is it is unstable. Initially, it was implemented for TCP congestion control. There are kernel modules that can plug in and implement like Reno, Cubic, uh, MBBR, you name it. And the Structops was initially introduced for uh, to extend the kernel this way. Since then, it turned out to be pretty useful and generic. Like SCADX is relying on stack on stack ops. Uh, this human HID uh, BPF is now switching from the old mechanism to um, to stack ops. Fuse BPF was using QDisk. Uh, folks uh, seems to be switching to the stack top. So it's it's is the beauty of it that is unstable. The people can make mistakes, and often they can. Add this uh, struct hopes like independently from uh, actually like modifying the core. It seems uh, that like why is it why we didn't do it in the first place? Why is like took years to uh, get to this idea? The main challenge was that BPF has its own like it's a BPF calling convention. It has instruction set and the calling convention and translation from the native calling convention to BPF is not as easy as it might sound. So there is the whole BPF trampoline, special trampoline generation that happening by the structop mechanism that translating native calling convention to the BPF one. And the challenge is to do it as fast as possible. And uh, But I think we're doing a pretty good job there since uh, all the performance looks to be good. Uh, furthermore, uh, SCADEX as a project started now almost uh, two years ago, I think, and uh, it was the main uh, driving factor for the, a bunch of features that we added on the BPF side, pretty much a lot of stuff like was done because like SCADEX like demanded um, much. Uh, tighter connection between the program and the kernel. Like if you think of like networking, what networking program needs to do, they need to process the packet. Packet is just like a blob of bytes. So there is not much of interface into the kernel as necessary. You have like bytes you process and you modify in the packet and maybe like you modify like extra metadata, like a checksum, uh, hash, the queue, queue selection, whatnot, but not as much of like full interface. Uh, for the tracing side, it's similar. Tracing is all like read only from read only into the kernel, so like walk the data structures, do whatever we want. So SCADEX put like a new dimension of how like BPF interacts with the kernel. Because like SCADEX needed to access like task structure, like CPU mask like natively, and not only as a read only, but as a read and write. It would need to like acquire, like take the proper reference count of the task structure so it doesn't disappear, doesn't disappear from under under the program, similar to CPU mask. So that's that was the motivating reason for um, what we call now a key pointer infrastructure to be added. Now we can put the pointers to real current data structure inside like hash maps, like global data, etc. And the whole BPF intro will make sure that nothing will like get like corrupted. So that's very different from what existed in networking and tracing. And because of it, like as soon as you put a pointer, you want to like operate on it. So hash table arrays existed, but that's wasn't enough, so uh, Red Black 3 was added, Link List was added, uh, then we had the equivalent of the C++ operator new, where this object new is sort of like a constructor of the object, and we keep all of the, the uh, verifier keeps the track of the reference count to make sure there are no like memory leaks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, didn't, uh, it didn't stop there, so once, uh, Schedule, SCADEX programs become uh, more complex. It was also clear that the existing algorithms that are there in the kernel are like not, not necessarily like combinable. Let's say making a, a, a forest of uh, red black trees is not easy uh, because you like red black tree inside the red black tree, and then if you want to start like linking, like cross-linking different. 
parts of the tree into like a linked list to become a graph. Uh, doing static analysis with this kind of data structures becomes like extremely difficult. So we moved some of it to the runtime, but if, but if, when it is a runtime, the tracking of the reference count uh, also getting complicated. Plus, there are a bunch of other algorithms that people want to implement, and it's it was clear that we cannot do it all, but like we cannot keep extending the kernel every time a new algorithm wants to, people want a new algorithm to be added. So there are basic algorithms that there, but like it has to like we have to think like differently how to like add algorithms. So that was the main motivation to introduce this uh, concept of the arena and this uh, may go to slash conditional break that I've talked earlier. Um, the goal here is to move some of the like in the past, like until this year, effectively, uh, Verifier was trying to do full static analysis with only a little bit of the runtime checking. Uh, with Arena, we kind of turned it around 280 degrees. Now Verifier is doing the minimal job and just saying, well, this is Arena pointers. I don't care where it points to. I don't care what you're going to do with it next. And instead, adds for every uh, access to it, adds a runtime access that we also did in the most efficient Way. So effectively, we are using the kernel like page table mechanism to make sure it doesn't end this four gigabyte region to make sure it doesn't affect the safety of the kernel or uh, other BPF programs. So that's again the way to the whole like BPF approach to implementing algorithms and interacting with them, verifying the program like changed once we like added this uh, arena uh, concept. And of course, like it's very early, it's 2024, which is, we'll see uh, what will come next. So with Arena, so far we demonstrated like reg, uh, regex, so string manipulation, the memory allocator as a BPF programs, like all of this now exists. Um, string manipulations will add it. So we opened the door to create uh, sh um, data structures and algorithms that should be shared. Right now, people just like copy paste the like copy paste the code, and nothing effectively shared, and that's 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 a pain. Um, we need something that uh, something like distribution of the BPF code, and uh, in my opinion, like uh, the way C and C++ did it over the years with package managers, like none of the distros uh, did it well. Like I think it's not the distro fault; it's the way that language. Uh, dictates how libraries should be compiled, what is shared, what is dynamic, how to manage all dependencies makes it difficult to, especially this non-vendoring stuff from distros. Like it's, I think it just depend. It's a management uh, dependency management pain. Uh, I think we need to learn from other languages, especially like Rust, that I think did it very well, and. I feel that the main reason is because it's the distribution by source. It's not going to be easy, but I think to be uh, successful in sharing what people accomplished as like in, in, in the BPF intro, we really need to think like hard how we design this uh, concept of the libraries and how we especially like design the sharing of them. So this is more like a call for call for action uh, with uh, sort of basic like guidelining like principles. Uh, we shouldn't, I think, like pretty confident. We shouldn't repeat what C did. Just a normal like compile into BPF .o, and here is your that a library or that so. Let's link it. Let's put it over the packages. That's we will be stepping on the same rigs at the, as the C C plus plus. Let's think and. Uh, Learn from the mistakes and do it do it better. Um, and now, like I will be talking about future stuff that we haven't uh, accomplished yet. So locks, uh, David mentioned yesterday, uh, locks are still a pain uh, for for SCADEX. So SCADEX wants to do way more than what it is possible now, um, and we couldn't, and we can, we still cannot like relax because logs analysis is all like static verification. Doing it at static time is, uh, the best we can do is allow one lock at a time and don't allow pretty much any calls while, while holding a lock. Even in this case, like when there are like bugs in other parts of the like BPF infrastructure, the logs are still possible. Or like other bugs, like unrelated bugs in the verifier or um, um, BPF core, 
because the spin logs is like a common, the most common data structure inside the kernel, like any kind of mistakes can cause a deadlock. Like we had a bug uh, where we were uh, copying the map value, and because like offset computations were wrong, we were simply blasting the zeros of a spin lock. And if you blast it at the right time when the spin lock is actually contended, it will deadlock inside the kernel and everything will be like sad. So uh, we need as a minimum with these logs, like without even talking about multiple logs or nested logs, we need a defense mechanism for our own bugs inside the kernel. So that's what's, uh, what's coming. We'll have logs that are resilient to tampering. Meaning that if there is like bug that like blasts zeros of a spin lock, like modifies it incorrectly, the kernel will not deadlock. Once we have this, uh, we have an ability to detect deadlocks, and once we have it, we can have multiple logs. Um, if they're like deadlocking in whatever way, the, this mechanism will detect it and will cancel out all of this without affecting the rest of the kernel. So it is a bit ambitious and uh, will take some time, but so far the results are, I would say, quite encouraging. So this is um, um, micro benchmark using log torture. Uh, 15 nanoseconds versus my one microsecond is the uh, time uh, of the critical section. And we're doing pretty well so far comparing to the kernel uh, spin lock implementation. Not surprised that we're both using the same MCS lock underneath. So it seems to be like scaling well, but like the deadlock detection logic causing this like extra uh, latency in non contended case. Uh, another part I want to touch on that um, BPF is Turing complete, despite what like people say. And we, John made a great presentation at a couple conferences ago demonstrating how it's done with the. Uh, what was it, like ABBA something, uh, letter manipulation algorithm that uh, proven to be equivalent to a Turing machine. Uh, the better way to prove it once and for all is to implement BPF interpreter as BPF program. And we're pretty much there. The arena and uh, may go to already allows it to do, to implement interpreter as a program except this we have uh, a bunch of uh, opcodes and a single switch statement <coughs> compiler will unroll into hundreds of the sieve branches and because of this like hundreds of branches verifier will complain that we're hitting this 8000 uh, branches limit so the only thing missing to do interpreter as a program is support for jump table and in direct go to so in direct go to instruction doesn't exist so this is something that uh, we will work on this is of course is more like a what, toy um, motivation, but uh, in general, like jump tables is uh, just like a mandatory feature to have for BPF to stay relevant uh, 10 years from now. Uh, similar with the call instruction, like tail call, it was just like a hack, nothing else for the lack of proper indirect call. Uh, it's uh, there are like all sorts of limitations, and there's a bug right now that we've been trying to fix for a year, where we don't count the number of tail calls correctly when the tail calls are done from the sub program, and the sub program tried to insert itself into this tail call mechanism, so it's uh, not pretty. Um, so, uh, Colex uh, indirect call instruction was actually added to LVM since the very beginning in 2014. Uh, recently, GCC uh, decided to implement it slightly differently and using better upcode. So, LVM well, last year was switched to do this. So, now both GCC and LVM can emit as an instruction. Upcode wise, it will probably stay the same, but of course, like on the verifier side, no support so far. Um, a bunch of things need to happen for this actually to be usable, but um, in one of them, this address of the instruction that uh, Anton hopefully is adding as part of the uh, static uh, static branch stuff. So that will be like part of this whole like mechanism. All of this like what BPF is is a collection of the building blocks, and if we make these building blocks as reusable as possible, like this giant puzzle, it uh, comes together nicely. Um, because we have Arena now, we can have like different algorithms, and uh, some of the algorithms, like obviously, like require bit manipulations. Like finding first bit zero or one is a pain in the loop. Like it's slow. 
we just we should just like add the add instructions to do it to do it efficiently like pop count is obvious one uh, rotate doesn't come as often but I think it's also like quite useful um, for certain uh, algorithms I mean bit rotate um, another uh, thing we observed that uh, we integrating with the kernel a lot more, and now we have helpers, uh, KFUNCS as the uh, RCU read lock unlock and preempt disable enable. From For the kernel, they're as cheap as you can get. RCU read lock is complete knob, completely optimized out, but when we're using RCU read lock in the program, it's a full function call. As a function call, the compiler is forced to not use or save uh, uh, register R0 or R5 through the call. So it like increases for the simple programs that's that's a, that's still relevant because it's a call. Uh, but for the more complex program the register pressure like increases and increases number of uh, spill fills that the compiler, compiler has to do. So the idea here this is work in progress to uh, add support for uh, this attribute no caller saved register initially was added to GCC long ago to support uh, calls and writing C code for interrupt handlers, and uh, uh, client added the support for x86 only as well, so it's not a well-known feature. In whole kernel tree, there is one function, turned out, that actually using this attribute. Not sure why, it's not an interrupt, it's some like, unrelated, uh, but it's there, uh, support is there, so we're just like going to add it to the VPF backend with some extra stuff, and that will uh, definitely like improve performance for more complex programs that <coughs> use this uh, uh, simple uh, function, simple helpers and the key funks that uh, can be in line. Um, another uh, motivation for the extension in the future is uh, the way BPF was done 10 years ago, x86 was still dominating platform where ARM and others were kind of behind. 10 years later, ARM is just as powerful, if not more. Risk V is a good contender. But for on these architectures, like VPF ISA doesn't match to these architectures as well as it does as it maps to x86. They have a lot more registers, like general popular purpose registers, both like colleagues save for passing the arguments, for saving the register, and we're not taking advantage. So the, the, the performance delta of the code compiled into BPFSA, G2 to X86, or G2 to the ARM is bigger on ARM um, than X86. So, what we need to do something about it. We need to close this uh, performance gap, especially for uh, ARM64. So, there are like several ideas here, and none of them are easy. The most obvious one is to well, let's just tell compilers that BPF has any number of this virtual register and just use register allocator in the kernel, then the kernel will know what architecture is doing it too, so register allocator is not as hard, potentially, especially even if you put it on a slide, register allocator in the kernel should be easy, right? But if you're a compiler guy who've been working on compilers for years, then it's immediately becoming crazy, uh, but maybe still doable. There is a question. Yeah, sorry. I mean, um, <clears throat> I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by virtual registers. Like, if you only have four bits in the instruction to specify a register, like so you have an infinite number of bits. Like, it's, it doesn't matter. Like, we, we can have, have like four <laughs> byte instructions. It's oh, all so new instructions. Okay, sure. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I, I thought you were meant adding it to existing ones. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. So uh, another idea is to uh, stay within this four bits, uh, as as David mentioned, and just use like few extra registers that compiler can use, and then say, well, uh, have tell that uh, this is a program not. Is portable because typically, like with your programs, you're not gonna compile it for x86 and then magically run on ARM64. You can now, but you don't have to, and that's not, I think, uh, uh, important use case. So we can say, like, I'm compiling into VPFSA, but I will be using these extra registers because I know it will map better uh, and have a better performance on ARM64. But then we'll just reject loading of the stuff on x86. That is easiest approach. It's easy to do in a compiler, easy to do in a verifier, can be hacked in a couple weeks, but probably something dirty about it, a bit hackish. Um, 
another, another idea is kind of similar, but we can have like fat binaries that are popular in some OSs where we just like compile for different like for into BPFSA, but with the assumption that BPFSA has different number of registers for 10 registers and for 20 registers. This fat binary have two codes, code effectively compiled twice, and then whether you are on ARM64 or on X6, you either load this one or you load the other. Also not necessarily the best solution. Uh, another approach could be to track, the verify already track the spill fill of registers, and instead of saving and restoring them through the stack, just put them in the, in the uh, general purpose register. That will definitely give performance boost on ARM, but it's and also relatively easy to implement, but it won't take the full advantage of like whole instruction set. So this is so far like several ideas. Probably like folks uh, will have uh, others uh, what to do, but I feel this restriction of the reg on number of registers that we put into ISA uh, kind of showing its age. Like for the first ten years it was okay, but the next ten years we got to do something about it. Um, another one, kind of related, is uh, so far we're limited to passing only five arguments into like k -funks. so like passing six, why not? Like we did five only, well, because it was easy, uh, but like we, we got to fix this. So effectively it's a bug in the uh, VPF instruction set and the calling convention, and there are like few ideas how to do it. We can use this extra registers and then convert them to stack access depending on the architecture, or just use the stack directly. But if you use the stack directly, uh, then it won't be as fast again on x86 and ARM. So the challenge is not to say how to do it, but to do it in a way that's actually like fast uh, on uh, native architectures. Something to think about it. Um, why, once we accomplish all that, uh, like six plus arguments, indirect calls, indirect jumps, then we can compile the kernel. Like maybe we would need to support the uh, struct by value uh, passing. Currently, this is also undefined uh, territory. But once this is all happens, we just can compile the whole kernel as as we have. <laughs> And afterward, it opens the door to a bunch of other things that we like didn't didn't imagine. So, uh, like imagine your whole kernel is now like analyzable. Like what I see, what instruction, what the BPF allows you to do is to see inside this binary. It's no longer will be a blob, but you will see what is going on in the kernel. So. I think this is, there is a huge potential there, but we have to like walk before we run. Uh, Yun Hong will talk about uh, stack. I just picked divided stack here as the name, so naming is the hardest. It shouldn't be confused with a split or segmented stack. That's what like compilers do when they have this stack, uh, not, not non contiguous stack. In this case, the, the rough idea. 512 by stack in VPF is uh, people hit it from time to time and have uh, over the years made all kind of like walkarounds for this. We got to fix it. Like that's another bug in the in the architecture. Yes. Sir, so, yeah, I mean, Alica also um, emits a ton of extra instructions compared to just like statically allocating something on the stack as well, right? Mm, like, isn't it basically yeah. disallowed in the kernel? Mm, well, yeah. so. Yes, it, yeah, alloc is disallowed in the kernel, but it doesn't emit anything. Like alloc is just uh, for in user space. This is like s. Like if you say alloc a ten, yeah, you get some minus space. ten. That's yeah, it. Yeah. That's that's, that's the, as cheapest memory allocation as you can get. That's that's kind of the motivation for it because like you know first it will succeed. Like in this case, like if it's variable, we not be able to guarantee. But if it's a constant, you're saying like alloc a fifty, like we will guarantee, like the infrastructure will guarantee yeah, that yeah. it will succeed. And if we do it this like divided stack approach, we'll be able to guarantee the location of the stack. Right, okay. And so. it will be like a lot faster than anything else because it's kind of allocation, but the stack allocation. Like kernel doesn't right. allow this because it's kernel, like it has like one stack. We can do better. But it's, so just to be clear, make sure I understand, so you're suggesting like a static call to Alica, so not like a dynamically sized Alica depending on how many entries are in a, an array or something like that? Because that I think is... Maybe both, yeah. why not? 
Uh, okay. Well, we can just, I think the, the, the philosophy that Linus has said before is if you know, the, you, you always have to have at most like a maximum size of alloca that you can safely call, right? And if you know what that is, then you might as well just do a static stack allocation because it's a lot faster. Mm, but, uh, no. Even, even if you know the size, like the size may be, let's say, adjustable by core. Like uh, one of the use cases would be like iterators that will put on stack, but iterators potentially like have mm -hmm. a different amount depending on the kernel. So you will, might patch the size that you will pass to a loca at a lot of time. Ah, oh, I see. So it would still be static, but it would be dynamic yeah. across. Oh, okay, interesting. Thanks. Then uh, cancelable programs uh, also comes from the motivation that uh, not everything can be done statically. Uh, Follows discovery that once you do like loop inside the loop, uh, you can have uh, billions of iteration, and that's uh, not safe enough. So there are several ideas how to do it, exceptions and. Um, partially there, fast executed another approach, like depends how it will play out. So this is definitely like work in progress, but the use case, I think the motivation is, uh, I hope is clear. Um, and switching gears a little bit, um, tracing, the way the tracing was done for the last 10 years, it was done for the kernel. And the kernel is a great target for observability, especially once we added like BTF to it, it's written in C, uh, BTF matches well to the C language of the kernel, and it's, it's easy like, to see what, what is going on. Like, we have all of the tools, the stack, stack workers are working well, so BP and BPF trace is a tool that allows this easy observability, uh, became like, super popular and easy to use, people use it daily in some cases to observe the kernel. I think what's missing in this, like, uh, infrastructure is same approach towards the user space. And user space is, well, dominated by other languages other than C, like C++ majority, and C++ has a ginormous dwarf in the production application that take gigabytes. Like, we have to do something about it, like think differently how we analyze like user space, like applications where the languages are different and BTF is no longer like a good fit. Uh, U-probes, like Andre doing a like, great job like improving U-probes, Jiri is doing this u probe stuff. Where is Jiri? Oh, here. It's excellent, excellent work. Like it's all, like it's all adds up. Um, but in part, and, but we don't have enough like USDT, user space trace point across different languages and somewhat chicken and egg because U-probes were not fast enough. So people were like, why add like anything like this trace points to the code? We're, when it won't be used. So fast U probes, I hope, will enable addition of more USDGs throughout the user space ecosystem to Python interpreters, to Java, to Hack, to potential like bunch of C++ libraries because there will be tools that will give this like ease of use and easy access observability to the user space. And similar for the kernel, stack work is pretty much guaranteed because either I, the frame pointers or org for user space, just S frames or uh, enabling frame pointers will not be enough. So it's okay for like C++, but for Python, you need language specific stack worker to actually make it easy to use. This again, like it's not gonna be solved uh, tomorrow, but this is the focus area. And uh, the other one is uh, one million, uh, instruction limit. So this is something where hitting, like I would say in the, uh, in the past, the verifier was, people were cursing the verifier because it was dumb. It's like, oh, how could you like didn't understand what I'm trying to say here. Now verifier got actually, I think in most cases, like smart enough um, to understand the safety aspects of the program. But because it's still limited to this one million instruction, this is what I feel like hitting folks most of the time now, well, not most of the time, but it, let's say more than 50% of the use cases, something changes either in the compiler or in the verifier and will hit this one million limit. So there is no real solution yet, but this is something we have to consciously focus on to be able to fix. As a workaround, uh, the recommendation, of course, is share, like put, the, put everything in self-test, then if compiler changes or the verifier changes, we'll catch it and we'll fix it because it becomes of the part of the kernel release. Or if you cannot share it as a source, put it as a elf object files. Like we'll just run the verstat and make sure that there are, there are no regression. Uh, as a second point, 
check like how many instructions you're already using in your in your BPI program. If it's like 100k or above, it's already danger zone. Sooner or later, it will break. So going back to the earlier slide, don't use always in line. Use uh, static or global functions and do the proper proper modern modern loops. Uh, that's the way to stay uh, in a reasonable uh, instruction limit. And there are like few ideas that we can do um, to increase this one million, but uh, that's probably a topic for a different discussion. Um, another, yeah, I'm definitely out of time. Uh, sorry, KP. Um, almost, almost finishing. Um, <laughs> KP allowed, thankfully allowed me to run a little bit over. I promised five minutes, but <coughs> it's already 16. <laughs> so, um, what uh, what the isovaline falls like discovered, and pretty much everyone, the feeling, the pain uh, from the isovaline falls point of view, it's uh, they need to like anyone like doing like production. Uh, customer-facing products that use BPF, the main challenge is all the kernels. The programs need to be usable on all variety of the kernels, and uh, if you take the latest kernel, pretty much like if the verifier is smart enough, there are all sorts of facility to write whatever you want, but the, all the kernels still have like missing a bunch of things, and the verifier in general is much dumber. Um, for uh, data centers like Meta, though we run majority of the fleet is already on 6.4 uh, kernel, so all the BPI features are there, but there is a long tail of the kernel version. So there is some stuff, there will be like 100 to 1,000 machines somewhere, and when you're owner of the BPI program, you still have to support this, well, all the kernels. So it's effectively the same problem as uh, uh, startups uh, and the companies do, and the data center as well, but from a different angle. This, all the kernels um, make writing BPI programs unnecessarily difficult. So the idea here, like what, what we can do about it, is to make uh, BPF subsystem upgradable independently from the kernel itself. Like people, like distros especially, they like to be like stuck on particular kernel version, and uh, there is a big like resistance of adding anything. So um, the idea here that is more technical solution to uh, non, not necessarily like technical program, problem. Uh, upgrading the kernels might be done through this once we start like thinking that BPF can be this like uh, sort of like a kernel module that we can like remove. So the existing kernel module mechanism is not enough obviously. Uh, if we say like in smart remote will be doable, just like have modular modularize everything like around BPF, including verifier, all the maps. As a code, as a technical project, it's easy, but on practice, it won't be uh, uh, acceptable because, like, in any environment, you have some number of BPF programs loaded. So, what you're going to do? Remove them, unload, unload the whole like, part of the kernel, not usable. So, I think it had to be something like a live upgrade where the program's still there while we are upgrading the whole part of the kernel that's responsible for BPF. Maybe it will be just a verifier. Maybe it will be like verifier plus something else. But um, a solution is still like has to like crystallize. But the, the problem I think is uh, acute um, of this long tall long tail of kernels, and it has to be solved one way or another. Uh, I think tracing observability and the networking is more a solved problem. I wouldn't say that were done, but all of the new things that are coming in like tracing and tracing and networking space, they're like incremental improvements. I would say the biggest is probably programmable like QDisk, um, but everything else is more like incremental improvements. And not saying it's a bad thing, it's actually a good thing, it's a sign of maturity how BPF as an engine like succeeded in the tracing and the networking space. Uh, on the security side, like uh, KP will, will talk uh, in a few seconds, uh, how uh, BPF LSM is going to evolve and what's the challenges and opportunities in the security area. And another big growth area is scheduler. As I said, the SCEDEX and QDisk for tasks and packets. It's, it's an algorithm that, uh, like, in the kernel, there are like different schedulers for both like tasks and packets. Like, scheduling anything is 
is where that's where the programmability is necessary. So like no no wonder that uh, these two uh, took advantage of VPF. And I want to close with uh, VPF uh, mission statement. Like as you can see, the innovation that happened. That's like why we do what we do. Why I like <clears throat> work on it still. Over 10 years, the PPF infrastructure kept innovating and re-innovating like itself, and the advances in it like allowed the projects like SCADEX to innovate in other space. So this too, I think, is what the crux of the of the existence of the VPF. There is no, and the last one is to challenge what's possible. We like we just talked about like uh, alloc and stack allocation. Like kernel doesn't allow it. But this is something we like need to think that to challenge it. Just because kernel doesn't do something, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't. Because like something wasn't done forever in C, it doesn't mean that we should stop there. So that's where I leave you with. Thank you. Um, I have two two questions. Like one is. Um, do you think like going forward the next 10 years, I mean more like a high level question, but do, do you think how, how can we, do you think it became harder or easier to use? So like I'm imagining like the users, like I think 99% or maybe of the developers on the BPF ecosystem that, that write programs, um, maybe outside of our kernel community, right? So like the, I'm thinking like how can we f um, facilitate more for them to um, efficiently implement programs. Maybe libraries is like the one answer to that as, 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 as one point, right? But like, what's your point of view? I mean, I feel like partially for us it became maybe easier, more flexible the way, but maybe I, I'm wondering like for outside perspective, right? Given those are the majority of users that would consume it. I think they, like everything that we did, like core uh, verifier improvements and everything, like uh, iterators like it made it easier to use but because we're carrying the whole like baggage of like stuff is still there and because of like stable api we cannot just cut this uh, cord so and because of the long long uh, tail of the kernels so we're kind of making progress but at the same time it's still hard so i think it's so it's yes and no <laughs> My my second question would be: Do do you also see? Um, I mean, like growth inside the kernel is one area, but also like growing into applications itself would would be another. Do you also see like BPF um, as as like one one big direction in the future as well to to be more like embedded in applications to um, solve things that we like maybe similarly we solve in the kernel, but to also have the flexibility there. Mm. Like the main VPF power is uh, observability. Once you and safety, so there are of course like use cases and people use it already, like outside of the kernel, when they need this safety and analyzability of the code. So in those use cases, yes, but only those. So in general, like user space, of course, as the whole, like will, will not will not benefit. But in case when you want to like send something over the wire to like a different server and execute there. Uh, and you want like a safety guarantees, then that that could be another area. I really like uh, you know your your forecast and your your aspirations for the next ten years. One of the things that uh, building off what what Daniel mentioned as far as usability from an outside perspective, I'd like to see is kind of updating documentation and focusing on what can be used on what kernel versions and things like that because there has been so much growth in the past five, ten years, you know, from the start. It's such a quick moving technology. And you referred in, in your slides to you, you constantly see these old functions and helpers being used and that's because a lot of the documentation was written at the start of core and it's on someone's blog. At, may or may not have been updated. And so that is the number one hit for BPF out there. And while there, there are the internal documents in the kernel, kind of looking kernel version to kernel version to see how those grow may not be the best repository for the, this information. Have you given that any thought on how we can kind of bring this back and, and say, 
you know, this is Well, I completely agree that uh, better documentation is always, uh, it's like, it will play a big part of it. Uh, what, but it's not gonna be the, like, even the best documentation, like, we also, like, here, some people complain that the documentation is so bad, and some noobs, so when they start in a community, they say, oh, like, it's unbelievable how much, like, how well this documentation, like, the amount of documentation that already exists, and how well it is written. So, uh, there are, like, two sides, uh, two, two opinions always, but I agree in general, the documentation definitely, like, has some way of, like, needs some form of consolidation. So, building on this, beyond the mailing list, uh, do you see some of the BPF organizations creating a, a documentation repository to kind of archive some of these these new pieces, or do you just are you leaning more on the code? It's a community, right? So, like, we can only like influence this much. So, at the end, is if people have their each, that's what. Uh, they will scratch and documentation, this is how it grows. Like one of the biggest source of documentation was the uh, Cilium docs and probably still is, but it was like focused on like Cilium use case and network in specific. So if you, let's say a Skidex developer, like Cilium docs is kind of useless to you, right? Especially like for this like new growth areas like Skidex, there is no like real documentation that you can do, especially when Skedex like requires new features to be added to the VPF infra. Yeah. Thanks. I think we have Brandon here, so that's a good task for a new book. <laughs> yeah, books of course. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Oh. Just, just like briefly continuing that, that kind of topic. I, I think. Um, you know, we have a, a BPF developer community, right? And, and that, in a lot of cases, is not this group here at this conference. So maybe um, kind of outreach to other conferences that that are more focused on different areas may also help. Like, I'm thinking in terms of, like, the always in line and, and some of this kind of stuff, right? Like, what does it look like to build modern BPF? Yeah, I agree. So uh, I would say I completely agree, but I'm not the evangelist. I'm not the person who does this kind of stuff well. So I can complain about it like to you yeah, guys. That's good. That's good. Um, <clears throat> so between the new instruction groups think that we saw yesterday and it looks like you are looking forward to introduce quite a lot of new instructions, which is cool. Not only instructions, yeah. Instructions. Well, yeah, but I, I am a little bit concerned regarding the encoding of the instructions. You remember last year we had this little chat about uh, yeah. this BPF ins kernel struct and I think people agree that this should be a way that respects the kernel UAPI backwards compatibility. And still being able to introduce new instruction formats so we are not forced to reuse instruction fields, multi byte instruction fields are as opcodes as we are today. So before introducing new instruction encoding, will it be possible to actually meet someday, I don't know, maybe in some of, uh, uh, office hour or something, and basically fix, see if we can fix that? Well, the existing ones we cannot fix, but in terms of adding the new ones, yes. Like, if we are thinking about like adding like hundred new instructions, it's got to be like thought through a bit more than the, let's say one here, one there, right? Through this extra uh, hacks as a source register, this register, yeah. and whatnot, right? So we already uh, just rough ideas. We already have a uh, concept of the sixteen byte instruction, and. Another code is completely empty right now, so that, to me, would be like the most natural way because like Verifier and like different OSs, they already like understand eight versus sixteen, so it's not like something unusual. And sixteen, this the second say eight bytes is completely free to carve out as cleanly as possible. Okay, thanks. All right, so we need to close the session to move on with KP. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, KP. <laughs>